It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program Jeet here. He is the senior editor at, uh, or a senior editor, I should say, at the, the New Republic. On his piece, Donald Trump is not a populist. He's the voice of aggrieved privilege. Welcome uh, back to the program, Jeet. Uh, good to be back. So, all right, let's, um, now, you know, I, I've been fascinated uh, about the sort of the different characterizations of Trump and his appeal to the Republican Party uh, that uh, kicked in, I guess, a couple of weeks after his his announcement when people started to realize that he he may very well have some some traction. Um, and uh, the the latest is that it's his populist rhetoric. We even see him sometimes sort of uh, uh, an uh, analogized to uh, to um, to Bernie Sanders. Of course, I think you know people tend to be talking about two different types of, of populism. But you argue that um, he's not really a uh, populist, um, as much as I think some Republicans are are hoping to uh, to argue. Yeah, no, I think I think the populist label is uh, misapplied to Trump because um, uh, I'm partially basing this on sort of some uh, uh, research that was published uh, in the New York Times where they did a sort of breakdown of who supports Trump, and it's really the Republican base, right? <laughs> like, it's like he's a Republican candidate and he's doing better than everyone else because he's popular among Republicans. He's not very popular among anyone who's not a Republican. Like, he's... he's Pretty widely loathed by independents and, and Democrats, but uh, if you if you ask Republicans, you'll find that they support him, and that includes people who call themselves moderate Republicans and also uh, college-educated Republicans. Now, um, in the world I live in, college-educated Republicans are not populist. Like like if you're a college-educated Republican, it's highly likely that you're making you know um, much more than the average income. So uh, I I just don't see uh, that is a proper label. I, I, I think he um, he uh, is the unvarnished face of the Republican Party. Yes, and that uh, that last part in particular, I I agree with. And and and, and let's talk about the the support because I think so much of the um, the 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 talk around Donald Trump is focused on Trump. And in some respects, I feel that that this story at the end of the day is less about Trump, but more about what has been created over the course of 25, 30 years. And I think, you know, some would argue has always been there. But I would I would argue has been has sort of moved from the uh, the broad margins uh, closer to the center of, uh, you know, it's no longer the wings of the party as much as it is the fuselage, it seems to me. Um, but the yeah no I, I think that's exactly right like I think uh, um, the I mean Trump didn't come out of nowhere right uh, you know like it's you know like in some ways it, it, it's similar to like um, all these uh, closeted um, conservatives who oh are you there Okay, folks, give us uh, one second. We're going to uh, ring him back. Um, we'll be right back. Sorry, G. Uh, we lost you there. You were you were talking about uh, these these closeted conservatives. Yeah, well, I mean, just like it, it's like in some ways, uh, I mean, the way to look at Trump is that he's an uh, uncloseted conservative, right? Like the, the the closeted, you know, you find these closeted conservatives who suddenly, you know, turn out to be uh, hiring male prostitutes or found in the men uh, having sex in the men's room in a washroom, and it's like. It's so shocking. How did this happen? Well, it's not shocking. It's like who they are, and it's not become public. The same with Trump. It's like, why is it so shocking 
that someone who made bigoted remarks about uh, an ethnic group is suddenly the leading candidate of the Republican Party. It's not shocking. It's just something that's coming out of the closet. Yes, I mean, I think um, uh, in some respects, uh, Trump is just is talking, uh, is 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 delivering the subtext, uh, and uh, and the others are just de- delivering the text. But let's talk about this notion of. You also make the argument in your piece that um, that the the sort of the the definition of of what is populist has been. Um, is 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 largely incorrect, or has been in some ways, uh, I guess, distorted over the years. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's an argument that you know sort of historians have. But if you if you go back to like the origins of the term populist, it's the sort of you know People's Party of the 1880s and 1890s, and they were like you know sort of farmers from the West who were like uh, upset about things that uh, many of us today are upset about. They thought America was becoming too corporate, that the robber barons had taken over, that democracy was in danger, uh, and their solution was uh, to have government solutions, to have government nationalize the railways, to take over public utilities, uh, to try to expand democracy by having direct elections of senators and by giving women the vote, right? So the, 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 by the 1950s, there was um, a change in the way people saw populism because uh, historians like Richard Hofstadter, most influentially, started to say, um, link populism with uh, right-wing movements, and to say Joseph McCarthy is the heir of the populist. And I think that's kind of mistaken. I mean, I do think there is a type of right-wing populism, but if you look at someone like Joseph McCarthy or the John Birch Society or the Tea Party, none of them are really populist. I think they're more accurately described as rich people's movement. And they, 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 they use populist rhetoric, but they're usually um, uh, financed and uh, controlled by wealthy Republicans uh, and are usually uh, designed to preserve privilege. I mean, McCarthy was used, uh, was financed by, you know, Midwestern business elites as a way to fight the New Deal and to fight labor unions. Um, uh, the Tea Party is, is similar. Like, if you actually look at the demographics of the Tea Party, uh, it's people who are actually wealthier than the average and uh, have better education than the average. So I, I think it's like it's not um, a grassroots movement. These, these are kind of like elite movements. And, and they're especially movements to preserve privilege. Uh, they're movements of aggrieved privilege. So I think that's worth bearing in mind. And, and um, uh, Hofstadler, Aristadler, it seems to me, had had talked about uh, this concept of, of status anxiety, which it, it seems to me is not terribly different from aggrieved privilege, right? I mean, I mean, that just seems to me to be inherent. Status anxiety seems to be sort of um, almost baked into the cake of the, the conservative brain because there's a certain amount of authoritarianism and then there's a certain mm-hmm. amount of, of sense of like everything that's out there that you are, uh, that you are not intimately aware of, uh, or, uh, understanding of is out to get you or ruin your world in some way. Yeah, no, I, 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 th- I think there's something to that. Although I, I don't quite, I, I, for a variety of reasons, um, uh, I think I'm not happy with status anxiety because I think what is really at the root of this is like power. It's like a fear of losing power, and the, and these are movements that are, uh, you know, they're, they're the movement of the haves, and they have this sort of like, you know, fear of social revolution. So uh, you look at something like the John Birch Society or the Tea Party; they were both uh, uh, given a lot of money by the Koch family, right? So I, I think that uh, the, um, uh, I, I mean, the status anxiety analysis sort of makes sense, but I really want to highlight the fact. That what's really driving this is a fear of social change and a fear that like the wrong people are you know gaining in society, whether it's like immigrants from south of the border or women, right? And I, I think if you look at Trump, like it really seems that his base is energized by his so-called his war on so-called political correctness. Like if if you yes. hang it around um, Trump followers or look at what they're posting online, they really love the fact that he's not politically correct, so-called. And then basically what that means is he's willing to stand up to non-whites and to women. And, and so, so I think that's what's driving us. And, 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 and also, you know, those sort of, I guess, those, uh, those race and gender traitors 
who ally themselves with uh, non-whites and women who talk all namby-pamby, and Trump is not, not willing to do so. I mean, I think that's the, you know, because at the end of the day, I mean, Trump is starting to offer policy solutions on some, uh, uh, to some extent that are um, really, uh, in, in some ways, aligned with Bernie Sanders, right? I mean, he's, he's been uh, very vocal, or at least uh, in the past, and I think he's, he's, he's at least touched on it on protecting Social Security and Medicare. He basically mm-hmm. this weekend made a strong argument for progressive taxation and against a flat tax. Um, this is all stuff that, but that to me seems coincidental to really that fundamental part about him not being PC, that this is so much about a, um, a dis- dispositionally in some respects. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, 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 th- I think that's right. I mean, it would be interesting to know if, if there's a economic stance that he's taken, like help him, or um, in some ways maybe they open up a vulnerability within the Republican Party, because I, I do think that like just based on you know, um, uh, the enthusiasm that he got for the, the Mexican comments and, and for taking on Megyn Kelly. Like, it, it does seem a lot of this is based on, uh, yeah, yeah, being Mr. I'm not PC and I'm willing to uh, tell it like it is and stand up to people. Um, I, I mean, there is a sense in which the economic side of republicanism has always been less popular than the social stuff, right? Right. That the, um, you know, in some ways the, the social anxieties are used to, to sell a, a really unpopular economic agenda, because unless you're like, you know, on the 1%, these policies don't really help you. Um, so I, I think in some ways Trump is, I mean, what might be terrifying is that there might be a shrewd move on his part to like, you know, um, move away from the unpopular economic policies uh, and to give people what they want, which is like, you know, Social Security, Medicare, uh, uh, progressive taxation, and combine it with all these uh, racial and gender anxieties. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that he knows that he could take these positions uh, that are economically sort of at odds with the with the typical Republican fare, and it's not going to cost him any votes with uh, his base, which is apparently like, you know, 15, 20 percent of the Republican Party. Uh, it's mm-hmm. not going to cost him any votes because at the end of the day, they don't care. They just want some measure of respect or look to him because he's so powerful uh, powerful projecting. And then he's just sort of picking up some other sort of stray votes by actually offering some policies that resonate with people. I mean, Social Security has broad uh, popularity, even amongst the Republican base. Mm-hmm. Here's one, one point that, that interests me that nobody seems to be touching on. You have a, a conservative mindset that is so uh, authoritarian in its, um, in its just sort of worldview. I mean, that's what really just sort of like uh, hits all the synapses for them. It seems to me that the Republican Party has this has has overlaid on that conservative um, predisposition the idea of money and and poor shaming and it's I guess corollary that well you are sort of morally righteous if you're rich and this guy's a billionaire yeah. and so he that's right that's right yeah yeah no I mean I, Trump is the ideal that they've created right like and and if you remember uh, I don't know if you're uh, as old as I am, but I, I remember when Trump first emerged in, in the 80s mm-hmm. uh, as a public figure, and that was really part of Reaganism, right? Yeah. Like, Trump was exactly the sort of, you know, greedy um, uh, SOB that, that, that you would see, you know, coming out of, you know, the 1980s of, you know, like, greed is good, uh, that decade. And then he, he became a big public figure because he doesn't hide his greed. He's very ostentatious. And, 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 yeah, I mean, he is a, a real child of that era. Uh, so, I mean, I, 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 do, I just think the Republican Party is, is getting what they deserve. And the only problem is uh, it, it's also going to affect other people <laughs> outside the Republican Party. Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I would argue to the better. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Josh Marshall wrote a piece um, uh, that was, I think, uh, in some ways inspired by the piece that you wrote. And he called Trump, um, he said, one of the great in- injuries Trump has already done to America and our collective dignity is we're now forced to take him seriously in terms of understanding what he represents in political terms. 
to me, he, I mean, he's a, uh, that's one of the, uh, on the contrary, it's not a great injury, it's a great service, because it seems to me that at one point in this campaign, we're going to get to the point where all the stuff that the, the, the establishment and the sort of the mainstream conventional wisdom will get past the idea of like, he's got better name recognition, he's simply a showman, it, down, and they'll ultimately have to uh, land on this notion that the Republican Party has been building shadow Trump for years, right? And it just yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, that yeah, the no, guy shows I up mean, and it is the moment fits. where Dr. Frankenstein realizes that the monster has a will of its own and yes. can't be controlled, right? <laughs> That's the moment of the, where we're at. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, no, I think in that sense, it's good. I mean, I, I just worry about the repercussions because I think one of the things, I mean, there's always, obviously there's always been a lot of racism, but Trump is really normalizing racism in a way that we haven't seen since George Wallace in the 60s, right? Like, uh, I'm just, just basing on stuff I see online, like, there's that sort of, there's a type of language that you used to see on, only on Stormfront or on right. these, like, you know, neo-Nazi websites, which is, like, becoming more aggressively vocal. And, um, uh, and I, I mean, like, because I write about Trump, I get that stuff all the time. And so I really feel that a lot of these, you know, hardcore white supremacist types who might have gotten along with the Republican Party because of the dog whistles, but now they're, like, really super enthusiastic because of Trump, and they think, like, he's their man. This is their moment. Uh, and, and that's kind of scary. We can see this even in the context of Jeb Bush, right? I mean, his yeah. language has, has changed, too. This guy wrote a memo about not using anchor babies, and, and now the best he can do is, well, I only meant it about Asians. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's a huge problem for, for Jeb Bush. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's almost as if Trump were created in a laboratory yes. to, like, open up all the fissures that, like, the Republican elite would normally want to keep closed, right? Like, like, he so perfectly hits on all the issues that kind of, like, are internally problematic for the party, the sort of division between the business elite that wants immigration reform and the, the base that doesn't, you know, or the um, business elite that wants, you know, to, to gut Social Security and the base that doesn't. Like, like, like Trump really um, is opening up all the wounds. Yeah, and in that sense, it's delightful. And, and do you, I mean, uh, you know, I, I have been trying to, I mean, I don't think that there is really a line of attack that takes any votes away from Trump at this point. I mean, I really don't. Uh, it, it's conceivable to me that maybe he doesn't have the the ground game, uh, or maybe and, and and his actual desire to become president is 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 a, is another issue I want to touch on in a minute. But I mean, I don't see how unless he loses four billion dollars tomorrow, because I really do think when he sits on that stage with the other Republicans, they can criticize him all he wants. The people watching that debate have been trained for years that if you are a billionaire, you necessarily are just better, period, than everyone around you. You have the better answers. You lead the better life. You are more morally righteous. God is shining down upon you in a better way. All of it. And it doesn't matter what they say to him. At the end of the day, this is the billionaire. And we've been told that money is the, the measure of virtue in our society. Yeah, no, it's hard to really see anything that they can get on Trump where, um, and, but also because he can override their methods. Like, I think if you go back to, uh, 2012, like when Gingrich was riding high, Romney was able to kind of like, you know, destroy him with all these attack ads in Florida and Gingrich just didn't have the money to respond. I mean, the thing with Trump is like, you know, just because of who he is, he gets all the free media and he, he has, you know, he's kind of a genius at social media as well with like Twitter and whatnot. And so he can like talk over their heads. There's, there's nothing. And then really what, what opposition research can you do against Trump? Like what can you say about this guy that isn't like already amply on the public record? Right. Like a everything's going to, I mean, all this stuff I think will stick to him in the general, but, um, mm -hmm. but yeah. in, in, in the president, in the, in the Republican party, I mean, all of his, all of what we perceive as liabilities, I think, simply go to uh, his strengths. And so here's my other question. What's his exit strategy? 
because I mean, I'm fairly convinced that a guy like this does not want to be president uh, because of the amount of work involved. And, and why would he why would he want to? I mean, he's he wants to appoint the president. I have a, a, a theory about what the what the exit strategy is going to be. Uh, I think he's going to claim that someone in his family is ill and he has to drop uh-huh. out uh, both as a to show that he's selfless in terms of his family and in terms of the country. Uh, do you, what's your notion? Or is it just not even worth a guess? I don't know. I mean, like, it's hard to know with a figure like Trump. I mean, I, I do actually kind of agree. It's hard to imagine him going all the way with this. Um, and there's a lot of, I mean, like, he really hasn't been building up the ground game. Like, it's sort of, uh, I mean, he's been hiring a few people, but it would be hard for him to actually do that. I, I, I do think, like, one solution is um, just at a certain point, yeah, find, a, as you say, a pretext to get out and then throw your support around, like, Ted Cruz, right? Like, right. I, think that, I think that would be, and then be the kingmaker. I mean, I, I think, yeah, that's, ex- I mean, I, I think your instincts are right, that the goal is to be the kingmaker, not, not to be the king, right? Like, um, uh, yeah, I mean, he tells us all the time, like, I'm a businessman, I want like to... them to come to my wedding, and this and that. He, yeah. It just yeah. seems that he would love to say, like, I've decided that uh, John Kasich is going to be the guy. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I do think there's a personal element with Trump in this, in the sense that he does not want Jeb Bush to be president. Like, he's kind of, there's a, a really great article by Gabriel Snyder in New York Magazine, which basically, you know, quoted Trump um, talking to a friend where he basically said, you know, like, if I'm going down, Jeb is going to go down with me. Uh, he's not going to be president. And because, uh, I mean, like, Trump kind of blames Jeb Bush for, like, a lot of the financial stuff of losing deals with uh, Univision. Uh, so, so there's a personal element to that, like. Uh, and, and give me your sense of, I mean, just looking at uh, those people who write about uh, this stuff. I mean, do do you. Is this, you know, I'm starting to see uh, pieces, uh, will Trump rebrand the GOP as a white nationalist party, et cetera? I mean, do you see any any change in the way that people are perceiving Trump's followers? I mean, because this is the Republican base, right? I mean, this is the, um, the, mm-hmm. the same people who ostensibly uh, ra- railed against uh, the Affordable Care Act, right? Uh, this, who now support a candidate who's for a single payer. Uh, uh, I mean, that, that's, that, that is about as much of a reversal as you could get. I mean, not, it, it goes beyond reversing, right? And, uh, mm-hmm. or they, um, they hate taxation and here's a guy who's coming out for progressive taxation. They don't like, they like less government, but here's a guy who supports social security. I mean, is it, is it wiping the veneer off this? I mean, at least in the eyes of those who report on this stuff. I mean, do you have a sense of that? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think people's, um, uh, at least uh, in a lot of the mainstream media, their ability to be delusional is pretty strong. And I think a lot of the sort of reference to Trump as a populist is a way of, like, you know, trying to create a euphemism for the reality, which is, like, he's a bigot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and that's the bigotry that's driving everything. Um, so I, I'm, I don't know. I mean, like, I think eventually it'll have to... Uh, come out. I mean, I, I think one of the interesting things is he's like leading among evangelical uh, voters, and like it's hard to imagine a, a politician in American public life that's like, you know, more antithetical to like religion than Trump is, right? right. Like he just like you know, you know, the the many marriages, the sort of lecherous behavior, the decadence, the celebration of wealth, you know, the the contempt for people, um, the contempt for the poor, like it's like. But, you know, evangelical Christians love them. So what can we do? I mean, I think it's it gets back to that notion of they've been sold this idea that, you know, uh, the 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 opposite of poor shaming is uh, is rich praising, I guess. And um, and, and this is yeah. the uh, you know, if he's this rich, uh, God must be on his side, it seems to me. Um, mm-hmm. and, and and I I mean, I think that's. I think that's coming home to roost a little bit. Let me ask you one more thing about the populist thing. Do you think, and I understand that this, that, uh, that, you know, you look at, um, the, um, uh, the, the paranoid style as perhaps the, the sort of the, the, the beginning of this meme of sort of re, re revising 
what populism was about uh, in uh, the the turn of the the I guess the 19th and or I should say the 20th century or between uh, the 1800s and 1900s. Do do you think that this is sort of um, there is an ease in which this is this sense is maintained as a way of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. In other words, one of the ways that the those with power will fight off any type of populist sentiment is to lump it in with a sort of virulent nationalism or anti-Semitism or racism. Yeah, I, I, I think um, uh, the, uh, there's that sort of hostility towards popular movements. And, and we kind of saw that with the way people are trying to say, well, Bernie Sanders is just like Trump, right? But, you know, like, I mean, there's a huge difference. Uh, I mean, if there is some overlap in terms of, like, uh, some of the economic stuff, there's a huge difference in terms of the racism, right? And so, so I mean, I think a lot of this sort of um, um, uh, trying to code this stuff as pure populism is a way of, like, resisting social movements. And it really came out of this sort of Cold War sensibility where, like, you know, main, middle of the road, mainstream America was good, right? Like, you know, I like Ike. So you want, like, sort of, you know, moderate Republicans or moderate Democrats and anyone who's like um, on the on the extreme left or the extreme right is poison. And I, I sort of want to resist the temptation to like lump you know anybody who's critical of the uh, um, social order as being the same as Trump, right? Like he is playing to a lot of populist anger, but there's like you know there's there's ways of being populist without being like an anti-Semite or a racist. Yeah, I, I uh, obviously I I agree. Well, it'll be interesting to see if Bernie Sanders uh, actually takes the time to to make a yeah. baseball cap that says "Make America Great Again" because that'll be <laughs> that'll be. The... Well, I mean, I, I mean, I think the more serious side of this is I think a lot of right wing populist sentiment comes from people who become dissatisfied with the um, the mainstream because it doesn't give them what they want, right? Like a lot of people turn to the, the extreme right because they feel like, you know, they're, they're losing their job, they're losing their ways of life. And sort of people like Trump can sort of um, fill, fill that void. So in some ways, you know, maybe the Trump-Sanders thing makes sense in the sense that unless you have like a strong left-wing movement like Bernie Sanders, you're going to get Trump. I, I mean, I'm not, I just am not convinced of that. I mean, because, and maybe it's just because I have spent the better part of of the last 10 years professionally and and frankly years before that just from a performing standpoint uh, listening to guys like uh, Rush Limbaugh and and yeah. and Donald Trump i mean the 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 issues are secondary it is really this basically this thing of like do not doubt yourself uh, that money is mm -hmm. a sign of the the wealth accumulation is a sign that you're doing things right. If you haven't, uh, there is something fundamentally uh, at the core of you wrong. Uh, in and, and you know, and of course, that judgment only applies to other people who are poor, right? Like, because you have been screwed over by the the black guy who got who cut ahead of you in line uh, because of the government. If you haven't gotten yours, and yeah. And all of this seems to be just um, a a function of that. It might be like rechanneling of some type of you know, so like slow, um, uh, you know, uh, loss of wages and and status in society. But at the end of the day, this is all this is all Rush Limbaugh. It seems to me. Yeah, yeah. No, I I think that's right. That's I think uh, uh, the uh, yeah. I mean, I mean that 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 does seem to be the the curriculum. And it's interesting that like in terms of Trump's ability to flourish despite the GOP going after him. I mean, he has a whole media network of his own, right? He has Ann Coulter, he has Rush Limbaugh, he has like there's a whole world outside of Fox News. And well, I but mean, he even that, has insurgent in Fox right? News, right? I mean, he won yeah. that that battle with Megyn Kelly because he had uh, you know Hannity and um, and uh, Fox and Friends, and he's yeah. he's more Fox than she is. That's right. That's right. Yeah. He, that's exactly uh, yeah, and, and uh, he uh, and he speaks to the the Fox core audience in a way that she doesn't. So in in again, it it uh, comes back to the fact that there's a kind of salutary ripping off of the mask, right? Yes. Like, yeah. And I um, I got to say, I'm enjoying it. Um, Ajit here, thank you so much uh, for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It's, it's been great to be on. 